Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks so much uh, to the Presidential Precinct and uh, most especially to the incredible fellows uh, who have been joining over the last six weeks. Uh, uh, not had the honor to, to meet you this year, um, but I am always overwhelmed uh, with awe for the work that you're doing <clears throat> in the incredible places uh, that you engage. So let me just begin with congratulations, especially to the fellows. Well done um, and go get them. Uh, we are today thinking about extraordinary leaders. These fellows are amongst those extraordinary leaders. Um, I'm gonna highlight just briefly uh, a little bit of sort of a few little snippets into an extraordinary leader that whose shadow has cast uh, long over this landscape and that's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson is one of the founding fathers uh, for the new nation. Uh, he is also born and raised right here in Albemarle County and is the founder of the university where I currently teach. So we're gonna take just a few little windows into uh, some of the work that he's done to ask questions around what does it mean to be an extraordinary leader. In 1774, Jefferson began a sketch for his garden. That's a garden that would actually be part of a massive landscape that sits just a few miles away from here, his mountaintop home called Monticello. And that sketch would be for a series of scrub um, uh, hedges, that are adjacent to a series of walks that would guide people, direct people, how to get to the house. And over the next 20 to 30 years, Jefferson would undertake a number of different sketches for the various gardens and components of that landscape. They would include a deer park, which is kind of a crazy thought, but a big open rolling landscape pockmarked with a few little, hill, with a few little trees and uh, clusters of deer so that one, one can see the kind of picturesque beauty of that landscape. They would include, include distance views, of course, of working fields. And it would also include uh, an incredibly long uh, fruit and vegetable patch immediately adjacent to his house called Mulberry Row. Now, the Mulberry Row patch is particularly interesting because not only would it be a source of provisions for the main house, but it also was a bit of an experimental ground. Jefferson was one of the leading enlightenment thinkers around horticulture, experimenting with new crops and trying to import new things. Now, why do I talk about Jefferson's gardens? Well, I talk about Jefferson's gardens in, uh, because they're both beautiful, absolutely. They're a source of scientific endeavor, absolutely. And a beautiful vision and a sort of undergirding of uh, scientific inquiry are fundamental to the launching of the new nation. But I want to posit something about those gardens. They were decidedly not democratic. We associate Thomas Jefferson with the birth of American democracy, modern democracy, right? Absolutely, absolutely true. But not everything he did was in fact democratic. Who enjoyed those gardens? Right? The views over those landscapes were from a particular location. Right? They were curated to be from a particular spot, a spot that he and his guests would occupy. The food of those gardens were consumed largely by the people who would dine at his table. And who have I not mentioned yet in any of this conversation? All of those gardens, those landscapes, all had to be maintained, of course, by an enslaved population who had almost no access to that beauty, had no benefit from that, uh, from that science. So that democracy, the democracy that we associate with Thomas Jefferson was not in fact realized in his gardens. That first sketch was in 1774, two years later, he would draft a document that many of us in America hold up uh, as fundamental to the birth of our nation. That of course would be the Declaration of Independence, an incredibly important founding stone for the launching of the new nation and the establishment of modern democracy. The first line in the second paragraph of that incredibly important document begins with these words. All men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now he actually meant men. We often now translate that it conveniently in America to be people, right? mankind. Jefferson actually meant men, but he didn't actually mean all men. Right? 
when he drafts that line, he would, 10 years later, draft a huge manuscript called Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he would unpack some of the complexities of the Virginia landscape for his Parisian audience. And in that other book, 10 years later, he would then say that it was really quite clear that there's a fundamental deficiency between people who were born white and people who were born black. He begins a foundational hierarchy for distinction within humanity. So when he says all men are created equal, he actually means all men, carving out women, but he actually doesn't mean all men. He says all men, but one of the painful realities that we in the United States have to come to grips with is the fact that Thomas Jefferson never imagined an interracial America. That's a painful truth because we want to elevate Thomas Jefferson and there's much to elevate about Thomas Jefferson, but we actually have to recognize that he's situated in a historical moment. Now he would dedicate his life, he would dedicate his life to building up what I call the architecture of democracy. Beginning with, actually not even beginning with, some, uh, some documents before the Declaration of Independence, uh, but he would then design the Capitol building that stands on the crest of a mountain in Richmond, of a mount, I shouldn't call it a mountain, a mount in Richmond, uh, that would be the Capitol building for the new Commonwealth. He would be the Secretary of State under George Washington, helping to build out the new federal city that would be Washington, D.C. He's discoursing with Madison, debating on the, uh, the architecture and the infrastructure of the, of the Constitution. And then near the end of his career, he would pit, oh, by the way, yeah, he's President of the United States, that too, right? So he has uh, ex expended his life building out this architecture of democracy, rhetorical architecture, as well as physical architecture, actual buildings. Right? Those two things are the same in his mind. They're, one bleeds in, into the other. But then at the very end of his career, he pivots to launch my university, the University of Virginia. Now we often talk about Thomas Jefferson's commitment to the establishment of the University of Virginia as this next thing. He's already done democracy, and now he's doing education. But what would Jefferson say about a corrupt government? The best defense against a corrupt government is what? An educated populace. The best defense against a corrupt government is an educated populace. So his commitment to launching the University of Virginia, in fact, is the culminating, is the capstone of a life dedicated to the architecture of democracy. The University of Virginia is part of the project of democracy because education is fundamental for democracy. But when he launches the University of Virginia, he's importing many of those presupposed uh, foundations from both his garden, in which slavery is an assumed condition, an uncontested assumed condition. He's also importing some of the fundamentals that he's written into the Declaration of Independence, that this is about men, oh, and not all men, but white men. Men who have, because of the sort of artificial construction of race, have inherited a certain sort of uh, capacity, false, but, a, but his belief. Those get imported, of course, into the launching of this incredibly important new institution called the University of Virginia. And the University of Virginia would be this institution dedicated to importing the fundamentals of an enlightenment science, enlightenment thinking, enlightenment critical thought into the launching of a new citizenry for this new nation. Discarding medieval and late medieval frameworks by which knowledge should be created, he's warmly embracing the Enlightenment. That's fantastic. That's incredibly important. Provides a fundamental um, platform for the launch of the research university in the later 19th and the early 20th century. But his commitment to exclusionary practices around white men would persist. And that's actually where we have to give a pause. Because the University of Virginia was an institution that for 
its first half century, 1817 to 1865, was a plantation landscape, a landscape dependent on an enslaved population. The United States Civil War, of course, helps to eliminate, terminate that regrettable, horrific institution. But racism persists. And there's the difficult historical reality that the University of Virginia doesn't admit women or people of color in any numbers until 1970, a full century after the Civil War. University of Virginia is still predominantly serving only white men. And that moment in 1970 comes with really complicated, difficult, fervent argument that we must preserve this commitment because Thomas Jefferson's beliefs in the superiority of white men survived, ladies and gentlemen, all the way till the 1970s. And so there were arguments leveled in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, that in fact, if the University of Virginia, in fact, does admit women, and slowly admits people of color as well, this institution will become degraded. Right? Our robust standing, our academic commitments will melt. We will not be the institution committed to a sustainable democracy that we've always been. But the painful truth is that those detractors were wrong. The University of Virginia's profound position as a leading public institution in America today is a byproduct of a trajectory born in the early 1970s. Those who believed that it was dependent only on this particular commitment to elevating white men, turns out they were wrong. UVA became the robust, top-tier, world-class university that it is today because we admitted women and because we admitted people of color. So there's a profound lesson to be learned here as we think about Thomas Jefferson, a cornerstone figure in the launching of the United States. And that is that democracy is both an idea, it's a vision, it can be a vision that is beautiful, it's a rhetoric, but it is also a practice. Democracy is also a practice. And so Jefferson's great idea about democracy has to be reinvented and reinvigorated by later generations. And only through that continued commitment to Jefferson's idea, do those ideals actually become fully realized. America is a far better place today because those boundaries have been deconstructed consistently through the 19th and the 20th centuries. And we have to continue to do that work to fully realize Jefferson's idea for a sustainable democracy in the present. And I tell this story because I've had the great pleasure of previewing the three presentations you're about to hear. All three of them are fantastic. And all three of them are committed to opening doors to people in their communities who have been historically kept out of access to the public space, dignity, and authority and power. And that's the work that's essential, that's fundamental for sustainable places, for sustainable countries. And that's exactly what these great leaders, the Africa Idea Summit, are all about. And that is doing the work, implementing, living these democratic ideals so that they're realized for the flourishing, not of themselves, but of their neighbors and of their communities. And that is an incredible thing to be lauded. And so, in sum, it's important for us to recognize that we can very easily elevate somebody like Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, there's much, to be, there's much to be celebrated. But we have to remember that the hard truths 
the hard truth of situating them in their particular context gives us the potential and the power and the authority to actually realize those goals in the present for all of our communities and for all of our neighbors. And as, as we now transition to the presentations by these incredible speakers, I'll encourage you to think about what would it mean if these folks were not doing their work? What would it mean for their communities if they were not giving of themselves and giving of their work and their lives for the people that they actually really are elevating in such powerful ways, right? We need these kinds of leaders. We need to encourage and support them in their work so that they can make their places healthier for all. Thanks.